Disruption and radical change have become an entrenched part of the business landscape. From here, capturing growth opportunities involving your business amid uncertainty relies on keeping pace with emerging trends. Welcome to the ComBank Foresight webinar series, designed to equip businesses with the insights and tools to support your vision for the future. To do this, the series will bring leading experts and businesses together to examine the forces reshaping business strategies and consumer behaviour. Over four sessions, we'll explore the pathways to adopting sustainable and socially responsible business practices as an avenue to build resilience and growth. We'll also seek to demystify the impact and value of social purpose in the eye of consumers. With the digital economy gaining prominence, we'll shine a spotlight on cybersecurity and keeping your data and business safe. In turn, it's becoming increasingly important to maximise the use of data and AI to power better business decisions and connect with customers on their terms. We'll look at how you can make this happen. So thank you for joining us to examine the latest research, insights and perspectives that we hope help you plan more confidently for a brighter future. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You've just heard from Mark Kuda, our Executive General Manager of Commercial Banking here at the Commonwealth Bank. My name is Adam Smallhorn and I have the pleasure of being your host today and one of your speakers. I come from the cybersecurity uh, team within ComBank and, and I'm delighted to be here today. But before I kick off, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet to today. I'd like to pay respect to all elders past and present. So today we're here to talk about cybersecurity. And of course, this is part of our foresight series of webinars for businesses in Australia thinking about what's next in terms of uh, moving on forward from the past two years, which have been quite a different and unique period. You may have had the, the opportunity to, to witness one of our previous cybersecurity webinars, but today we're taking a bit of a different focus and, and taking that executive look. We know that people are um, aware of the, the power of technology and the need to focus on emerging th things and threats like cybersecurity. Today, we're going to take that lens of how do you manage it? How do you look at cybersecurity from a business lens and perspective? And how can you make sure that your organization is safe and secure into the future? Without further ado, I'd like to introduce some of our fantastic speakers that we have joining us here today. So the first person I would like to introduce is Daniel Baker. So Daniel is currently the Assistant Director General for Technology Uplift at the Australian Cybersecurity Centre. We're very lucky to have him to here today. If you're not familiar with the Australian Cybersecurity Centre, it's the centre of excellence in Australia for cyber awareness and, and uh, motivating people and businesses around Australia to uplift their cybersecurity, also with the remit of government as well. So they've got quite, quite the task. That's where Daniel works. Um, he leads ACSE's work to assist government, large enterprises, small businesses and individuals to increase their cybersecurity maturity. Dan has over a decade of experience in intelligence and cybersecurity. He's also previously worked as a penetration tester, a security architect, and in senior technical roles in cyber threat intelligence, disruption, and telecommunication security. Dan has also acted as the Assistant Director General for Critical Infrastructure and Technology in the Australian Cybersecurity Centre, responsible for the protection and cybersecurity uplift of Australian critical infrastructure and advising on the security implications of emerging technologies. Dan is a very busy man, as you can imagine. I'd like to introduce our next guest as well, which is Cornelius Ma. Cornelius has 20 years experience in network and cybersecurity and delivering cybersecurity resilient solutions. He has a focus on hybrid cloud environments and artificial intelligence to ensure organizations are enabled while also safeguarding their data and applications. Cornelius is the field CISO for Fortinet in Australia. He provides leadership and strategy for technical, pre-sales and support initiatives amongst their customers. He works closely with partners and customers to understand their business drivers and risk posture to reduce their risk to an acceptable level. So thank you everybody for joining us here today. We've got an excellent set of content uh, planned for you and I can't wait to get into it. Uh, but first I'd like to touch on cybersecurity just to give a little bit of an overview and a high level of of why it's important and why we need to focus on it. First off, wouldn't be a bank presentation without a bank disclaimer. So let me give that quickly to you now. 
Everything you'll hear today is general in nature, doesn't take into consideration your unique circumstances. But if you are looking for that tailored advice, we highly recommend you seek it out because it can really be helpful in guiding your cybersecurity strategy going forward. Well, without further ado, let's let's start talking about why cybersecurity. Why do I need to care? You know, as a business uh, person, you've probably got a lot of things going on, a lot of priorities, and often they're all competing. Here's just some cybersecurity numbers at a glance to help put it in context. So, according to the World Economic Forum and their Global Risks Report, um, in you know, cybersecurity is now presented as the n- number four greatest global risk. Um, to the global economy in terms of um, businesses and development. So the pandemic, uh, inflation, the skills shortage, cybersecurity, despite all these kind of recent changes, still remains uh, really key on on that global uh, risk to to global businesses and the global economy. So if it's not on your radar as as a business executive, it's something that you should really be considering. The other statistic comes from the Australian Cybersecurity Centre itself. And that's the annual threat report. And when looking at at the data from the 2020 to 2021 financial year, the ACSC just received over 67,000 reports of of cyber incidents. And that means that equates to about one cyber attack in Australia reported every eight minutes um, when averaged out. And interestingly enough, you know, we've been in the industry long enough now, that number is getting smaller. It used to be one in one every 10 minutes. It's now getting um, a lot quicker, particularly over the past couple of years with, with the pandemic. And then finally, some statistics. If that wasn't enough to kind of frame why cybersecurity is important, I guess this is the one that, that uh, strikes us the most, uh, which is the cost of if something goes wrong. And, and some recent reports from IBM um, report that the cost of remediating and investigating and hiring the people of a, of a cybersecurity attack, in particular a, a ransomware attack, $4.62 million. And that's followed closely by the cost of uh, responding to a data breach, which is $4.24 million. And that's a big number, but when you think about it, when you add up the cost of remediating, the reputation damage that you have to do when you advise your customers that that their data has been breached and leaked, leaked on the dark web, or or perhaps um, your business systems are, are totally disabled through a ransomware attack for weeks and months at a time. We see plenty of incidences in Australia where that has happened. So it doesn't um, take long for that cost to really add up. But if you didn't need, um, you know, if you needed more convincing, uh, there's another reason why it's really important to focus on cybersecurity inside your organization. And that is just the reputational damage that that can come from it. And these are just some of the recent cybersecurity headlines we have seen in Australia and globally, uh, you know, certainly a lot related to the UK and threats. Um, uh, there's, uh, you know, he, my favorite um, my favorite quote here actually is, is from the nine Fairfax attack and, you know, whiteboards and texters, nine had to revert to old technologies as cyber attacks hit the tellies and the paper. And, and there was a quote there, it's just the second one down there that, the news director out of Melbourne, Hugh Nation, said that the Ferrari wouldn't start and we had to fire up the Datsun. Um, but of course, these these attacks are, are really common and they're increasing in their prevalence. Um, really, really interesting to think, what, what would it mean for our business and our organization if this were us? And look, there may even be some of you where we've already um, experienced an incident like this. What I want to do, though, now is just set a bit of a picture and, and think about we're talking about cybersecurity, we're thinking about it. Um, where do we sit as an organization? If we had to look at, you know, what does okay look at, look like? What does good look like? And what does excellent look like? And uh, please play along as I'm going through these examples um, because you may recognize where you fit in. And the first is company A. Company A is, is the kind of company where cybersecurity is a necessary evil. Um, Company B is, I guess, more developing and emerging where they know that cybersecurity is important, um, but they're working working on it and it's not quite there yet. Through all the way to company C, where it's really embedded in their culture and their staff are really engaged and understand the importance of cybersecurity. Um, To to look at some of the, I guess, characteristics of these different organizations and to see if if this fits you, I've got um, some examples you can kind of consider. 
We do often like to talk about um, an organization and cybersecurity in terms of people, process, and technology. So it's a really good lens to, to think about and look at these three companies and understand if it fits us. So company A, um, they, they typically have a low appreciation for cybersecurity. Um, if anything um, related to cybersecurity comes up, it's often reactionary. So they're responding to an incident, they're responding to situations that arise and really don't have any strategic plans in place there, often cutting corners, which, which leads to the cybersecurity incidents developing. In terms of people, they don't have a dedicated cybersecurity function. They don't have a person responsible or accountable for it. I mean, their people, uh, if they know anything about cybersecurity, it's just by incident, it's not by design. From a process point of view, uh, you know, they'll have informal and ad hoc processes. Um, we certainly see this from the bank's perspective when it comes to payments um, and payment fraud can be a huge source of financial losses for organizations. Um, that's processes are, are a key part of that. On the technology front, um, they might have elemental, elemental security technologies with simple um, configurations. The, the security accountability is decentralized across the organization, so it may be up to individual teams and you may have pockets of goodness, but uh, it's not universal. They might, from a technology point of view, have no visibility of their IT fleet. Um, when it comes to updating software, which is a critical, important cybersecurity control, uh, the attitude is what, what updates. Um, we, we don't really have any visibility that we, we need to do that. Now let's take a look at company B, which is that um, progressing kind of organization that's that's growing in their awareness and understanding. And their attitude is more or less that cybersecurity needs to be more integrated into the business. Um, in terms of people, they may have a dedicated cybersecurity team or person um, accountable with that, and they're somewhat autonomous from IT. Uh, there may be some training in terms of their people. They may have some awareness uh, amongst the staff about their cybersecurity obligations, but it's mostly compliance or regulation driven. It's, it's more a tick the box exercise. From a process point of view, they, they may have better coordination with IT, but those processes remain informal, manual, and dependent on individual contributors. Um, so in a way, they're still working their way through it. From a technology point of view, um, they may have more advanced use of security technologies and they can perhaps spot a cyber attack if it were to happen, but not have full coverage. So they might be blind on some areas where they might be vulnerable in their cybersecurity. And then finally, we have company C. So company C is great. They are very culture driven and the cybersecurity is intrinsically aligned to their mission. So if you're helping and supporting customers, there's a realization that uh, cybersecurity is integral to that because it's the trust you form with your customers. So in this organization, security is well integrated. There is a CISO, they perhaps report to the CEO and is active with the board. Um, from a people perspective, that they have a large, well-organized staff with good um, work environment. Uh, the people will be engaged around cybersecurity even when they're not working directly in that space. From a process point of view, they'll be well documented and formal with an eye towards scale and automation. I mean, and from a technology point of view, they'll have an enterprise uh, security architecture. When an update or a patch needs to be installed, that's done, you know, within 24 hours. Um, they, they are thinking about threats, not just in a simplistic way externally, but also what threats do we have internally that, that might compromise our cybersecurity. Um, and, and it's just, in the hearts and minds of all, all of the people. Um, it's core to that mission. So I hope you had a little think through that, that spiel and where maybe your organization sits in terms of its cybersecurity maturity. Um, a big thanks to the Enterprise Security Group who, who did some of this, this um, analysis has been based on. But if you are a company A, um, what we find in those circumstances, the priority for a company A is, is seeking immediate help. There are some spot fires in terms of cybersecurity that that ought to be snuffed out. I mean, that's the most um, key thing for organizations in that situation. For organization Bs, um, what's really needed in that situation is help thinking about the big picture. So there's some excellent um, efforts going on, but what's missing is that coordination and holistic um, vision there. And for company Cs, they're doing excellent. Those are the companies that, um, where it helps them is that three to five year plan. What is our plan and roadmap? Obviously cybersecurity is always changing. What's the plan in place to deal with that as it adapts? 
So that's um, one way of thinking about cybersecurity. There's also another um, analogy that I want to give if you if you are new to cybersecurity and don't necessarily have that understanding. And I talk about it in terms of castles versus immune systems. So um, let me talk about the castle analogy um, just now. And this, I, in a way, it's an old way of thinking, but um, it gives the context of, of how cybersecurity has been thinking. And the analogy is, you know, cybersecurity can sometimes be like a castle for an organization. So obviously what what's nice about a castle well obviously you've got that big outer wall um, that's very well defended you've got the moat you've got the guards um, many cases you've got the archers standing on each turret of each corner they're pointing outwards um, they're scanning the perimeter and environment um, but what were the problems with castles and and this is certainly a, an analogy for how cybersecurity was done traditionally well a castle if you think about it You've got all the bad guys on the outside and all the good guys on the inside, or you hope, right? Um, and there's that real tension. We sometimes call it like a smarty or m and security where you've got this hard outer shell, but once you penetrate it, um, all the kind of security just dissolves. Um, notice that a castle, what, what if there's an insider threat? So what if I think it was Macbeth or, or the sun wants to um, you know, uh, take the throne a castle doesn't really defend against um, malactors inside the castle. So once they're in, there's that there's that risk. It doesn't acknowledge that maybe there might be a, a coup inside, and some of the people may um, overtake the throne. And then, of course, the castle's got those single points of failure as well. So once they get through that out one or two outer layers, you know, analogous to some of those firewalls that we have or perimeter security, once they're in, um, it's a bit of a free for all. So. The thinking in terms of cybersecurity has evolved a bit more to something similar to an immune system. So how does an immune system or the human body's defenses differ from a castle? Well, notice we still have that barrier. We still acknowledge that there's badness outside, but there's not as much focus placed on it. Yeah, we have a skin, it does its job, it protects us from all those um, the badness outside, but we acknowledge that you know, it's not always going to be our, our first and only line of defense. We need other strategies in place. Um, notice inside the body, rather than everything being trusted on the same level, we kind of have organs that are a bit separate from each other. And in a way, the organs don't really trust each other or they're little set units and there's a discreteness to it. Um, and that's a property that, that really helps in terms of uh, keeping the body kind of more isolated. They don't trust each other necessarily. When your barrier is broken, your skin, it's, it's self-healing. So it recognizes there's a problem and then it adapts and the scab forms and, and then it heals and regenerates the skin. The other thing that we have is the immune system, right? We have those T cells floating around and, and there's implicit there that the skin will do its job and all the other things will do its job, but bacteria and viruses still might get in. So we have a process in place in, in the human body to deal with and react to things. We have the T cells, the white cells, the antibodies. Um, there's institutional memory, um, there's an awareness of what, what's the latest virus and threats going around, and then a preparation around that. And then, of course, those pain receptors across the body. So when I hit my knee, um, the limbus system kind of sends those notifications to the brain. So there's some kind of coordination across the whole system. And castles, well, castles are a great analogy for cybersecurity as well. So too is the immune system. These are just some helpful ways of you potentially thinking about your cybersecurity. And, and they map really well um, to this next piece um, that I'm going to talk about. And that is how might you approach your cybersecurity? And there are actually a ton of frameworks and, and uh, I guess, guidances out there. Um, and they're all just ways of thinking about how you might protect your organization. Um, I'm not going to focus on any one of these. Well, I'm not going to deep dive into all of these, but and I'm not necessarily an expert in, in any of these, but it's just helpful to, to maybe pick on one and look at it and, and see how we might think about cybersecurity for your organization um, in terms of one of them. And the one that I, I pick is NIST. So NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology out of the US, and they have some good thinking around cybersecurity, um, and in particular, their cybersecurity framework. And what it does, what I like about NIST is that it breaks cybersecurity down into five main areas that are, I think, in, in a way, quite accessible to understand and appreciate. So the first is identify your assets. The second is protect your assets. The third is detect. 
detecting incidents. The fourth is, is respond, so responding with a plan. The fifth being recover um, and normal recovering to normal operations. And, and NIST is broken down essentially into subcategories here. So I won't go into all of these, but it is helpful to think um, in terms of cybersecurity, in terms of our organization, maybe we're mature, maybe we're the company B on that scale, or maybe we're company A, um, or maybe we think we're company C, but it's always helpful to look at an external framework like this and just say, are we fully covered? And the thing that I really like about NIST is that a lot of the frameworks out there, a lot of the guidance on, on, on cybersecurity is all focused on um, prevention or technical controls. And I think that is absolutely a huge component of cybersecurity. But back to that point I made earlier that often we think about cybersecurity in terms of people, process and technology. So NIST, I think, is really good in getting that balance right where, in a, you know, uh, protecting your assets, it certainly has the penetration testing. So the, the hackers that are testing your apps and trying to find vulnerabilities, but it also has things like what's the business environment, um, asset management in, in identify um, your assets. You know, you can't possibly protect all your computers and systems if you don't know where they are and what they are. So that, that's a key one. Um, and, and then also at the end of the NIST framework, there's respond with a plan and recover to normal operations. And that's something we're massively seeing these days in terms of ransomware attacks. So there's attacks where all your files on, on the, the corporate network are encrypted and your um, computers are disabled for months at a time. We've seen you know hundreds of companies in Australia affected by it, um, some companies twice, and it can be a real a real problem. Um, you know, if people are stuck in, in toll booths and the card won't accept the, the ticket. Um, having a plan in place that's not, go not gonna be technology-based, often it's comms, who's our comms person, who's our ex outside counsel that's gonna advise us on the legal implications here, how are we gonna get our operations back online? These are all things that you need to think about when with your cybersecurity. And I think NIST is a, is a not bad starting place to make sure you've just got all your bases covered. So with that, I'm, I'm about to hand over in just a sec, but I wanna leave you with a series of questions. Um, I can't give you all the knowledge you need to um, fix your cybersecurity tomorrow. And I, I wouldn't have all those answers in fairness, but there are a series of questions you can ask yourself or you can ask of the teams who might be helping coordinate this with you um, to understand your cybersecurity. So the first is, do we have someone in our organization responsible for cybersecurity? Do we have a culture of cybersecurity in our organization? If we were to experience a cyber attack today or a cyber incident, do we have a plan for right now? And do we have a plan for in the future? Are we thinking about cybersecurity controls through people process or are we just focused on cybersecurity being a technology problem? What are our legal obligations as it relates to the data we hold and any breaches? So there's the mandatory data breach notification laws you should be aware and across of GDPR. Um, how are we measuring our cyber security and technology risks? Because um, you can't buy down something if you don't measure it. And then how do we know that we have a well managed uh, and secure technology stack? So um, certainly not easy questions by any stretch of the imagination, um, but important questions because cybersecurity, um, I love to say that I work in cybersecurity, people are very impressed, but at the end of the day, and I, it's not so sexy to say this, cybersecurity is in a sense, just a discipline of risk management. Um, so I won't put that on my um, business card just yet, but it is, in, it is an important context to think that like many other risks, it can be managed um, if you take that mature framework. It's people, process and technology. You, you get the best bang for your buck when everybody is invested in it and understand the importance of cybersecurity. So having said that, I would now like to pass over to Daniel Baker from the Australian Cybersecurity Center. Again, the Australian Cybersecurity Center is that center of excellence for all organizations in Australia, government and private sector. I'm giving that advice and we're really lucky to have him here. We're gonna get some excellent advice here. So without further ado, I will pass over to Daniel uh, to take it from here.
Uh, look, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Adam, and, and thank you so much as well to uh, the Commonwealth Bank for having me along today to to, to talk. And, and indeed, thanks uh, to all of you for taking time out of your busy days to to come and listen uh, listen to me and listen to to the ACSC talk about cybersecurity. Um, it's really uh, it's really important from the ACSC's point of view having that remit for whole of economy cybersecurity. Um, that we're able to engage in forums like this, you know, with the banking sector because it's so critical to small to medium business and, and directly with small to medium enterprises because they really are the the engine room of the of the economy and that whole of economy remit. Um, I'd like to talk about four things today. So, firstly, starting off with a little bit of an overview of what we see in the cyber threat environment, uh, and then talk about, I, I guess, the where to get started. Um, for cybersecurity strategy and how that strategy process helps you select an appropriate set of controls, um, you know, whether that be you know, NIST, Essential Aid, Information Security Manual, ISO 27001, whatever that, whatever that may be for your, for your needs and your requirements. And then um, have a little bit of a discussion um, around how you go from being organization uh, B to being organization C and really having that security uh, culture um, that, that creates um, you know, benefits above and beyond simply having a, a bunch of technical controls that are implemented well. Um, so, so, to, so to kick off, and I'll, I'll thank Adam again for the reference to our, um, to our cyber threat uh, report, which I'll take the opportunity to promote. It's available on cyber.gov.au. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting read if you're interested in learning a bit more about the cyber threat landscape. But as, as Adam said in the start, um, you know, in the period 2020-21, the reporting period um, for the threat report, we received over 67,000 reports of, of cyber crime and cyber incidents. Um, that's, a, that's a huge, huge number. I'll call out two in particular, two elements in particular, and that's ransomware, um, where we had over 500 uh, large-scale ransomware incidents that we responded to uh, in some way uh, over that period. Uh, and that's about a 15% increase year on year, um, which, is, um, which is pretty frightening, that rate of increase. And, and it makes sense. Um, you know, Australian uh, businesses and Australian individuals um, are fortunate enough that they're able to, to pay those ransoms and um, and you know unfortunately Australian businesses and, and individuals are are paying those ransoms at a higher rate than than we would, than we would like so we continue to be an attractive target for ransomware syndicates the second piece that I'll call out is business email compromise um, and so we responded to around 4600 uh, incidents of business email compromise over that same period um, and and we estimate that to have a cost of around 82 million uh, also dollars um, to the Australian economy just in just in those incidents that we were aware of and that were reported to us. So that's that's quite a staggering figure figure as well. Um, so just in terms of cybercrime, you can see that that threat level is a consistent drumbeat in the background, if not a little bit of a, an, an uptick year on year. Um, so cybersecurity, you know, I, I love to talk about it, but it's never been a more important time to talk about it. And part of that is also um, because the cyber threat environment is largely a function of the geopolitical environment. Uh, and so, as you would have seen, you know, over the last few months, uh, you know, looking at the news, there's a lot more geostrategic uncertainty today than there perhaps has been over the last few decades. Uh, and the cyber environment's a reflection of that, both from state-based and non-state-based uh, actors. From a technical point of view, we're also seeing uh, increases in the number of, of CVEs, um, of vulnerabilities that are being um, publicly uh, disclosed. Uh, and we're also seeing um, an increase in the severity of those vulnerabilities that are being disclosed. And so over the last decade, um, we've seen about a fourfold increase in, in both the quantity and the severity um, of those vulnerabilities. But a very interesting factor there for, for, for me um, from that whole of nation perspective is the time that it is taking malicious cyber actors to be able to take that, uh, that CVE release or that proof of concept vulnerability drop or that or, or reverse engineer that patch to discover the vulnerability that was fixed in it and weaponize that and use that in a cybercrime campaign. Uh, that time is getting shorter and shorter. 
Um, so it means that our cybersecurity defenders need to be more and more responsive and respond quicker in order to get ahead of the threat. And that's a, that's a really big challenge. So how do we go about tackling this uh, heightened threat environment? And, and for, for, for many of you um, in sort of the executive space, the levers that you're able to pull in your organisation are really around setting um, a suitable cybersecurity strategy and getting that, that tone right from the top of the organisation. And there's really, there's really three, three steps to building a good cybersecurity strategy and, and you'll, you'll hear flavours of the NIST framework in how I'm talking about this come, come through. You know, NIST's a, a very uh, robust uh, framework um, uh, that, that Adam was talking about earlier and I certainly commend it to you for a more detailed read on the, on the topic. Um, the first is really fundamental to business is if you understand your business well, and you understand what is really important to your business, you should be able to jot down a list of what are all of those things your business needs to do to keep operating and identify the ICT assets that are absolutely critical to all of those functions. So it's, the, it's, the, it's going through the process of determining what's most valuable in your business um, and, and, and where are you most reliant on, on ICT or, or operational technology, perhaps if you're uh, in a critical infrastructure sector. Um, and it's identifying those prioritised assets and those prioritised systems. Now, the good news is if you've done um, business continuity planning or disaster recovery planning previously, a lot of this work might already be done for you and you might already have a really good grasp on what those critical assets are, what those critical systems are, what those critical pieces of information are for your business. And after you've done that, it's important to, to uh, go through a process of understanding what the impact is, if any of those are unavailable for a period of time. And that helps inform choices um, around what your threat model is, what threats you're going to be worried about, what hazards you're going to be worried about. Um, because building, a, building a, a network that's secure against all threats or building a system that's secure against all threats and all hazards is not something that's, that's feasible to do. Um, as, as Adam said, you know, good cybersecurity is good risk management. So having a really firm idea of the fundamentals of what you want to protect and what you want to protect those things from uh, is, really, is really essential. Um, another way of looking at it, and if I sort of you know, in, indulge uh, in, in a slightly technical tangent um, for, for just a moment, it's also good to have an idea about what properties of those systems are important to protect. So in government, um, you know, we're, we're obviously very uh, interested in protecting the confidentiality of information, um, you know, and indeed part of the role of the ACSC is in, is in protecting government's most sensitive uh, information at, you know, secret or top secret levels. Um, so there's that, there's that constant focus that we have on protecting the confidentiality of data. And that's super important in, the, in, in terms of a ransomware context as well. Um, as we're seeing more and more of that, you know, ransomware and, and, and extortion model going hand in glove where a ransomware actor um, will compromise valuable IP or sensitive uh, information or customer information uh, and then ransom it back uh, to, a, to a business. We're seeing, we're seeing that proliferate. So that confidentiality piece is really important. The integrity piece is also important. So being able to assure that your data hasn't been, um, hasn't been tampered with. Uh, and so, you know, you know, if you're uh, in a sector that's having customer records or, you know, indeed, if you're in, in, an, in an environment where you're sending invoices to people, being able to assure that your bank details on those invoices haven't been tampered with, that the integrity of that data is, is intact, super, super important. Um, availability, also really important. Um, and that's just making sure that your systems are being able to be kept online um, and, and, and able to continue to perform their function for your business. So depending on what the asset is that you're trying to protect, you might want to put more emphasis on one or more of, of those three pillars of cybersecurity, the confidentiality, the integrity or the availability. Um, so after you've gone about identifying what's most valuable, those attributes that are most important to protect. How to think about some of your threat models. So, you know, if you're in, um, you know, if you're in a in, in a small to medium enterprise in Australia, that's probably cyber criminals that you're most worried about. 
if you're somewhere in the defence industry supply chain, that might be more nation state you know, actors that you need to be worried about. Um, so there's this so there's this balance and calibration of, of figuring out what sort of mitigations you might need to put in place commensurate with the threat that you think your business is facing. Um, and then on top of that, you also need to consider what regulatory obligations your business might be under. So, uh, you know, Adam had on his slide earlier, um, you, you know, the, the payment card industry standard, uh, for instance, where if you're, you know, you're handling any sort of credit card information, you're going to have to meet that standard. So part of that choice is already made for you. Um, if you're a small to medium enterprise that's involved in, in critical infrastructure, there might be some additional requirements um, that, are, that are levied in terms of control sets to, to choose from. Um, so just to be aware of that as well. What are the controls that we typically recommend? Well, um, you know, I'm speaking from the ACSC, so of course I'd be remiss if I didn't recommend our essential eight um, control set. So that's eight, uh, eight controls that we strongly encourage um, both government and, and, and indeed small to medium business and, and large enterprise to use as a baseline cybersecurity set. So that's application control, um, patching applications and operating systems, controlling Microsoft Office macros, configuring applications in the most hardened way that they can be configured, restricting administrative privileges, multi-factor authentication, uh, and of course, um, backing up the most sensitive data. So on that you know, worst day that you have, um, when other controls may have may have failed and you're facing a ransomware incident, you've got a backup to fall to fall back on and restore from. Those controls um, done well, done up to what we call the maturity level three, is a pretty pretty in depth process. So what we uh, encourage uh, a, a lot of players in the small to medium uh, enterprise segment to to look into seriously is adopting cloud technology. And that's a way of being able to, to easily move from a, a typical on-prem IT environment that tends to be built around that castle mentality of having perimeter firewalls that are protecting, you know, a, a soft GUI center of the network, if you will, um, into more of that immune system model where you're able to leverage some of the technology that comes baked into uh, large cloud platforms um, for, for security and leverage the experience of those security teams to protect your, your information and your business. Um, use of platform as a service, software as a service, use of um, you know, managed uh, endpoint uh, devices, um, all of those things um, are, are typically very, very good for security and, and you're able to leverage um, many of those controls in the Essential 8 if those platforms are configured correctly for a much lower cost than trying to implement those uh, on, on premise. Um, with your with your you know limited limited resources, so um, there are some there are some catches there. Um, so it's important that when you do go out to a cloud service provider or you're putting your data into a platform as a service model, you consider what the shared responsibilities are. So you don't get um, you don't get security automatically um, adopting some of those cloud platforms. You do still need to consider what security you are getting and whether that's appropriate to your business and the confidentiality requirements or, or regulatory requirements you have around certain sets of data. Um, but typically um, adopting those sorts of technologies is an excellent way of getting much better security and, and getting securities from very experienced security teams in a, in a way that um, isn't typically feasible for, for smaller businesses to do on, on prem and on their own. So it's a great way of, of getting assistance to, to do that. Um, the final note that I'll just, I'll just make um, uh, before I, I hand back to hand back to Adam to, to continue on with the the presentation today, um, is just around cybersecurity culture, um, and that is that having a having a strategy in place is a really important first step, but that needs to be communicated really clearly down to your people, um, and and management has a role to play in making sure that your your staff and your business see security as an enabler for the business. Um, and, and that you're not stuck in that um, company A mindset of security as a, as a blocker. Um, again, adoption of some of those cloud platforms, um, usability and enhanced feature sets and productivity kind of come hand in glove with security. So it's a really nice win-win uh, situation for a lot of businesses. Um, but that culture thing is gonna be really important because ultimately the security of your business will, will succeed or fail 
on you know the attentiveness of your of your staff to to security um, in situations where you know those those technical controls might not hold up. So I'll leave it um, I'll leave it there briefly and hand back to um, hand back to Adam. But uh, definitely really looking forward to the Q and A session uh, at the at the end of the presentations. Thank you so much, uh, Dan, for that excellent summary from the Australian Cybersecurity Centre. They do uh, some excellent work in Australia and a fantastic resource uh, for for the country. So I'd now like to uh, move to our next section. In fact, what Dan, Daniel was talking about reminded me of um, an accounting customer that I, I'd spoken to once and were affected by a ransomware attack that, that got on the network and had encrypted their accounting software, again, on premises rather than cloud. And I think that's what I wanna to touch on now as I bring in Cornelius Ma. Um, Cornelius Ma is our uh, is the field CISO for Fortinet in Australia. And we're really lucky to have him here. And he's just gonna tell us a bit of uh, customer perspective. So thank you for joining us today, Cornelius. Um, really great to have you here. Um, let me start by asking this question. <laughs> Uh, can you just tell us a, a little bit of a brief overview of, of you and your role within Fortinet? Yeah, thank you, Adam. And again, thanks also for Commonwealth Bank for the opportunity to present with you guys. So a big thing that we've done and what we've looked at in the industry itself is we wanted to look at what are the biggest components from a business aspect. So if we're saying, you know, what is the implications? We want to secure businesses, schools and society itself. What does it mean? What are the gaps that we're seeing in the industry itself? And coming from an engineering perspective is we knew that there's a lot of technology that we can really help to bring and solve uh, a lot of problems. And, and we talked about the, the people process technology, but it's all driven by data. So what we wanted to do as well is to say, if we bring those components back into the business world, what does that mean? What would that look like? So the last two years I've been focusing, primarily speaking to, to leaders in the industry and CIOs and CISOs, and board members to say, what does that look like? Um, can be paint done? What does it look like from a security perspective? If we're looking at risk, cybersecurity is operational risk. 70% is risk what they already know. What is the implications and what can we do to help to reduce that? So that's been primarily my focus for the last two years is bringing the, the, techno the technology back into a business world so that we can understand both sides of the, I don't want to say both sides of the fence, but bring the technology and the business together. That's awesome. And I'll, I'll just make a little aside. If you do have a question for Cornelius, Dan, or myself, you can use the ask a question box beneath the, the video window. Um, ask that, we'll have some time for Q&A in a second. So having said that, uh, Cornelius, I'm, I'm keen to get your, you're obviously talking to a lot of Australian businesses. Um, what are the, some of the most common attacks that you're seeing these days? Yeah, the, the most common attacks is, um, I want to bring it back even to just one step uh, before that. Um, Eric Cole wrote a book called Cyber Crisis. And for everybody that's, that's new to cyber, it's, I would really encourage you to have a look at that book. Um, he was working for the CIA. He was also advisor to the 44th president in America. But he talked about, and he asked the question, what are our most critical applications that we have in business? And he broke it down to two components. One was, and, uh, um, you know, one was around email security. So that's one of our most critical applications because it's easy access to people. And it's also your browsers. So if we can fix or have a look at that from a security perspective, that will really solve a lot of problems in itself by itself. And Dan also talked about that from email security on the amount of threats that they see. So for me, that is the first thing that will really encourage businesses to look at. If we look at the, the other components around that, it is what do we what do we see people are doing that's quick? So that is still the component from denial of service denial of service attacks or DOS attacks. Um, the other one there that we see from number two perspective is the phishing attacks. It's the big well phishing. It is the, you know, it's still that component from pretending to be somebody else in emails. We've seen, and I don't want to say an uplift. Um, the one time we saw a phishing uh, campaign and I kind of got excited about it. And my wife was like, listen, that's bad stuff. Why do you get excited about some of these things? And I go that they've really changed the game. It was impressive to see where they've moved from some of the malware where they will inject themselves, where it looks like it's an email threat that's already in progress. 
and they will go and ask you something like, hey, listen, by the way, just change these account details. So the sophistication really changed massively. And it's like, oh my goodness, they've really set up their games in what we've seen in the last two years. That of course means that we need to do a lot of more uh, capability on the people side on education when it comes to cybersecurity. So for me, that's a big thing. And number three, that is a real big pain that we see in businesses. It is that almost like a curse word from ransomware. So again, it's that component from blocking access to your data is the one thing that we've seen. But also now that, that we've seen in the industry that the, the, the threat vectors, they know that people have backups in place. They know that they've got processes in place. So the next thing that we see in there is around data extortion. So it is, they almost don't care if you have your data backed up. It is if your data is not encrypted, they will go and release your data in the dark web unless you pay for their, for their services for not doing it. And that is a, 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 a conversation that's really, really a troublesome that we've seen in the industry itself. Yeah, I can only imagine um, what it's like for, for businesses to experience those, those kinds of attacks. Um, can you share with us what it's like when, when an Australian business is hit by a cyber attack like that? Um, say a ransomware attack, or you mentioned a business email compromise attack. What does that look like and, and what's going through people's minds um, when they're the victims of this? The one thing that we that I sometimes talked about as well is that your cyber life is not just living in cyber itself. We've seen that your cyber life, your spiritual life and your physical life has now become very much integrated with each other. Um, one of our, they are now customers that was also an FSI. They got compromised and we talked about the implications for them. So even from a people's perspective, right, is that one component from if you try to access your data and the next moment all of your data is encrypted and you cannot access your data. Even that component from a from a from a personal perspective is how do you prepare yourself for that so one of the things that we advise customers and people to do is the first thing is to do the tabletop exercises and what the tabletop exercises is doing is really helping you to prepare when something happens in the industry and and what we've seen there it is talking for instance to say number one is are we going to pay for a ransomware or not now, it's easy for me to stand on this side and say you should never pay for ransomware and uh, Dan talked about the fact that Australia is very good customers because we tend to be able to pay for some of those components, which is easy to say, don't pay. But if it's your business and it's your data and you can't service your customers, that's a completely different story. The other component around that, for instance, is if we're looking at bringing in the insurance companies, up to what point do you have control over your data? So that's a business decision you need to make in the beginning from if I want to pay a ransom, up to what point do we want to pay it? Who's going to do, in, do those negotiations for you? If we bring it back to the to a legal capability and a regulation capability and we look at the Saki Act, is at what point do you know about the notification to get the government involved to help you with the investigation? And one thing to bear in mind is the moment that you start to, when, you, when, you, when you're aware of the attack, is you almost lose control over your own data because now sometimes they need to go and collect data for the evidence itself. Now, the implications on some businesses that we've seen, it can be sometimes two days, up to 24 days. And unfortunately, we've seen a lot of businesses in Australia within six months that after a ransomware attack, they actually go out of business because they can't service the customers after some, some of their data that they couldn't get back. That's another component there, Adam, that we've seen is just because somebody say that, hey, listen, it's ransomware, you know, you can, you know, if you pay, you can get your data back. Those encryption components doesn't always work. So that's also one thing to bear in mind. Also, if we look at the component that we normally talk about, hey, make sure your data is backed up. What do we see in the industry is you can back up 100% of your data, but you can't always restore 100% of your data. So it's again to understand what is that level of acceptance going to be, even to the point of if I can't access my data, how are we going to respond or which systems are we going to bring up first? Um, if we talk, for instance, just on the implications on that, let's talk about the speed of a compromise. Um, if we look at one of the attacks that was called no Petya attacks about five years ago, and Merck, one of the biggest shipping companies, they got hit with ransomware. And that spread in their environment was 10,000 machines per minute. 
that got compromised. Again, just one vulnerability started to just replicate itself in the environment. So the implications is very difficult. It is very harsh in those environments itself. And to recover can really have an impact, not only on your business, but even on your people capability itself from how do you recover that. Um, another piece of advice is when you do your, your tabletop exercises with executives, it is that one thing that you will talk about is who's going to make decisions. And if that first person is not available, who's the second person that's going to make decisions? And even just have paper, have a pen and paper and have those things ready to have contact numbers on paper, because if you can't access your systems, you want to be able to have a look at that. Um, but also one of the components is have a look at some of the advice from ACSC. They've actually done a really good, uh, good work and documentation on what you can do to prepare yourself for this incident as well. Yeah, the ACC is really great, aren't they? Um, I, I guess my next question, we saw companies described as A, B or C, you know, the maybe the ones getting started through yeah. to all the way being quite mature. In your opinion, uh, where would you say most Australian companies are sitting right now? Most Australian, if I look at the stats, most are going to be sitting in that A and B. We are seeing more customers moving towards the towards the C, but we're not we're not there yet. If we just look at the stats in Australia, um, it's a big component then in answering that. And uh, um, Dan can talk about that as well. If we look that Australians are ten percent more prone, uh, com you know, for attacks compared to the rest of the world. So you kind of want to go and ask that question: Why is that? Right? Is if we look at eighty percent, no, more than things like what is it, ninety two percent of of Australian businesses. It is small to medium businesses. So how many of those businesses are prepared for cybersecurity incidents? Um, if you look at Commonwealth Bank, you guys are quite fortunate to have a real good skills and a real good cybersecurity team, but not everybody has those skills and those capabilities. So that is one component that we are seeing in, in, in the industry. How do we fix that? Um, that's the component from compliance and regulations. For me, that's a big focus as well in, in writing policies and being involved in that. And the reason is that it can be more than just a paperweight exercise. If we're looking at just implementing some of those controls, ACT8 is a prime example of that. We've seen that it can reduce your operational risk between anything between 97%. And if you apply certain frameworks, frameworks such as the CIS, it can reduce your operational risks up to 94%. So the capabilities, it's there, but we are not there yet, but we are seeing an, a better uplift towards that. But if we look at the threat vector itself, you know, from are we winning in the game or where are we in the game? We've seen just on ransom, we're almost an 11% increase or 11,000% increase, like that's 11 time increase, it was at 10.7 on just ransomware. And you kind of go, if that was just in the last year, what does that stats look like then from an Australia perspective? And Dan talked about that as well. So we are seeing an increase actually of Australian businesses that's been targeted but you can almost say it is not as bad. We didn't see an 11 time increase on that tax. So it's not that we are, we're not, we, we are getting better, but we are nowhere yet to the level what we should be. And one of the components there, it's, it's almost like fighting the hydro. You know, if you cut up one head, another head pops up in its place, but you, you need teamwork to be able to do that. And that's teamwork within the industry. And for me, a prime example is, is to look at what Commonwealth, Commonwealth Bank is doing as an example from how do you protect your customers from fraud? Um, even the basic things, right, from how you've authenticated somewhere is that you um, to, you know, enabling the two-factor authentication when you do banking. It's small things like that that can have an impact on the business. Um, and I've actually used uh, Commonwealth Bank as an example when I spoke to some other businesses to say, if you go back, if you, if you bank with, with CBA, or you bank with another bank that doesn't do two-factor authentication, which bank would you prefer? And kind of everybody to you know put up that uh, that green card to say two-factor authentication is important. And I then made that personal because I had an incident about three weeks ago where personally I got a, a request to go and say, hey, listen, you know, you want to authenticate to you the specific platform and it requested for two-factor authentication. And I go, hmm, my data has been breached. That is good to know. But if I didn't have the two-factor authentication, what would that implication have been? So again, it's real basic components that we can start to do to uplift the maturity in the businesses itself. But we are, we are I think, more getting towards that B company, but we have a lot of work to do 
to move towards that uh, level C that we that we definitely need to be in the industry. That's um that's all that's awesome, Cornelius. Thank you very much for those those insights and and uh, didn't intend for there to be a little compliment to ComBank there. We, we're really here uh, to help our customers and the community, um, but very nice nonetheless. I'd now like to bring back in uh, Daniel and we'll, we'll move into our Q&A phase. We have some questions coming in. I might um, throw the first one here to Daniel. Uh, Daniel, in terms of, uh, the, this question comes from Rod, in terms of cybersecurity attacks, uh, what are the early factors that we should maybe look out for? Yeah, look, that's a great question. And that's something we spend a lot of time here at the at the ACSC looking at is, is what we call precursors um, to those ransomware attacks. And, and look, um, as, as, as much as I hate, hate to say it, um, spear phishing remains a really, really common vector um, for a lot of ransomware attacks. So the first thing, absolutely number one thing to look out for is those suspicious emails um, that your, your, your staff may be receiving um, or even your clients are, are receiving as well. So, um, you know, be really on the lookout for any sort of suspicious email activity. Um, the, probably the second most uh, common thing that we see is um, attacks that are leveraging prior compromise of, of credentials or, or attacks that are trying to brute force or guess a password. So if you've got um, account lockouts that are occurring uh, more often than they should, or you're getting those emails from your, your cloud service provider or your, your um, you know, webmail service provider saying, you know, we've, we've blocked a suspicious login attempt. All of those sorts of things are really good first, uh, first indicators and warnings. That's awesome. I'll direct this uh, next question to Cornelius. Uh, cost is often a big issue for businesses right now. Um, is there an effective automated employee training and simulation package available that might help um, with some of these aspects? Yes, there's, there's two things for me on that. The first thing is that awareness training and uh, um, I'm happy to share a link. We actually have from Fortinet, we've got a value added services for security awareness training um, that people can register for and we can actually help your businesses to go through that and talk about the awarenesses that we need. The purpose of that is to bring the people process technologies together on that. Um, so absolutely, and happy to share a link with you on where you can create access to that. I just want to add one more question there as well from around the cost from the, the incidents as well that you've talked about. That for me, it's important also to bring in the cost of doing an incident and the cost of not doing an incident and the amount of money that you can spend to reduce that cost and bring it back to a maturity model. And I'm very happy to share some of those cost models with people that's online um, to take that also and share with them what we've seen the cost is, what you can do to reduce that cost and when am I spending too much? And when can I invest more money in cybersecurity? So happy to take that offline and share with people that is that's joining this webinar. Awesome, thank you. I might I direct the next question to Daniel. The question is: uh, Is there a list of email and browser security utilities that that meet a high level of cybersecurity? And if so, where can I find that information? Yeah, look, it's a really it's a really good question. Um, look. We're not we're not in the business of recommending any particular product or service, um, but I can certainly describe you know what a what a good good product or service would look like. Um, so really, with with browsers or email software, it's really important that you go for a for a reputable source. Um, and so you know, chances are if you if you you know heard of it or it's something that your IT team uh, you know recommends. Um, you know, it's going to it's going to be from one of those reputable you know companies. So so for browsers, you know Google, Chrome, Edge, Firefox, you know the the the, the big players. Um, you know there's no um, there's there's no real benefit on top of those by by going outside to sort of small obscure um, products. And often there's a lot of risk there if they're not from a trustworthy source. So that's something to be really aware of. Um, what's most important is how you configure that that software. So you can definitely get some great tips uh, on how you can go about securing your your browsers and particularly your your email servers um, that we've got on our website on cyber.gov.au. So I encourage you to check those out. Awesome, that is fantastic. Thank you so much, Daniel. And that uh, brings us to the close of today's webinar. We're just about out of time. I'd like to. Uh, Please join me in thanking Cornelius and, and Daniel in supporting us here today at, at the Commonwealth Bank Foresight webinar on the power of technology, focusing on cybersecurity. 
Um, it's been great to have you here. Um, please be aware you've got the other uh, webinars in the Foresight series, um, some fantastic ones. You've got data and AI and social purpose coming up. But I've been Adam Smallhorn uh, from the Commonwealth Bank. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and have a lovely day.